I just agree with this highly entertaining. We're live now, FYI. <laughs> okay. So as I was saying, I'm having difficulty oh, getting no. these two videos off of my cell phone. What is my is my thing in there? I think I gave you all of my scratch paper. I did. <laughs> Just when you guys thought you were off the hook, um, thank you for the exams. I'm inside everybody. Okay. If it was uh, just a bunch of blank sheets of paper stapled together, would you tell me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> after I after I put big red lines and, and a zero in the corner of each one. Well, that's fair. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Have you ever given uh, someone a zero? Oh, that's a stupid question. Like a grad student, though. A zero on a test? Yeah. Like the whole test? Yeah. No. Okay. Never. I'm just kidding. Obviously, it's happened. But I've had people not hand in a stellar model, though. Mm -hmm. Like, just not hand it in. Cool. That didn't bode too well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I made a new homework assignment. Um, in the past, what I've done is I've this homework I in the past have hit hard with it. It's like, let's do a full thing. And this time I decided, you know what? Um, maybe it'll be nicer if I make a homework where I say, I'm going to give you a pressure and a temperature, and then I'm going to one by one ask you to calculate all the parts to the gas um, without having to go straight into calculating the equilibrium conditions. So in this homework, I don't ask you to calculate equilibrium conditions. Okay, I just give you some conditions and say just feed me all the quantities that come out. Um, in the end, uh, if you know what the formula are, are for each of these things, they're just totally straightforward. And so that was my design this time was I'm going to design something that is going to force you, if you don't know the formula, to go into your notes, find the formula and go, oh, okay, I can program that up. That's two lines of code. And so you're basically going to build a, a code that's going to one by one knock these things off okay so the first one is gas particles and two and three are based upon basically today's and Thursday's lecture which is going to be um, uh, Boltzmann equation Saha equation and what I call recursive Saha okay um, so the first one is called gas quantities the second one is called excitation balance of hydrogen so that's going to be Boltzmann equation and then the third one is going to be ionization balance, um, where I'm going to ask you to calculate the ionization fractions of the first three ionization stages of iron. And I give you all the information you need. You just have to apply the formula. Okay? I'm going to pass that around. Here you go, Emma. Careful there. Um, like I said, the, we've done everything that's required to do part one. Uh, but parts two and three will be taught today and Thursday. Okay. Am I missing out on something? No. Is that on? That's a good question. No, it now wasn't. it's on. <laughs> You'd think I'd learn all of the pitfalls by now. <laughs> okay. Well, I have 50 points. Yeah, this is like 20 points less than the midterm. Hey, so I'll have a chance to make it up. <laughs> well, the homeworks all get added, uh, averaged in together. So this homework okay. is going to weigh more, but it's probably uh, more calculation intense. Um, Eric, you need a copy of the time. Do you have your midterm? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about this. Oh, I forgot my my other notes real quick. I'll be right back. Please. Does this involve computers? Yes. Yeah, it involves all computers. All the computers in the world. <laughs> Can you try it? Can you take a note for me? No, I think it's fine. I just didn't see for a long time. I'll let you use the little guy. 
left them in my car. Oh well, that's good news for me. Dude, that doesn't work for me. Okay, so um, we um, are in the notes where we're gonna we're talking about the um, ionization excitation balance. Okay, so I just want to go through again um, what we have in terms of the different processes that are happening. This is bound bound, sometimes known as BB. Okay, and this is bound free, also known as B F for bound free. Okay, so bound bound is the type of tra uh, transition in an atom that creates a absorption line or an emission line per se. Okay, so of those, you have basically uh, the photo process, photo excitation, which results in what? If you're downstream from that photon, absorption line, right? So you'll see an absorption line. <laughs> you have photo de excitation, which is really stimulated emission, right? Um, then you have collisional, excitation, now, does anybody remember how you get a collisional excitation? Collision? I guess what we're doing is we're just looking for different words for collisional. So this is, majority of this is you have the free electrons in the gas. The free electron comes within very near proximity of an atom. It has a lot of kinetic energy, the electron does, when it comes by. And some of that kinetic energy then be, can be transmitted to internal energy of the atom by exciting one of the electrons up to a higher excited state. Okay? called collisional excitation. Can happen if another hydrogen atom comes by as well, right? But most of the time it's a free electron, comes by nearby, creates an electromagnetic impulse, excites the um, uh, bound, bound state, and the kinetic energy uh, of the free electron is then diminished a little bit. Okay, so t basically you're transferring energy from the electron pool to the internal energy of the atoms. Okay. So usually an E minus passing by. Okay. And then you have collisional de excitation. And believe it or not, it's the same thing. It's an electron moving by. In this case, the kinetic energy of the electron uh, goes down, and in this case, the kinetic energy of the electron goes up. Collisional excitation, you're transferring energy from the free electron pool into internal energy of the atom. If you have atoms that are exci in excited states and an electron comes by, there can be a, an impulse between them, electromagnetic, that will stimulate a de-excitation and the energy will be transmitted to the free electron, its kinetic energy will be increased. Okay? All right, so what about bound, 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 free? It's the, basically the same thing. not just walking in circles for fun. So 
what do you have? You have photoionization. Right? It's basically your atom plus a photon. Okay? Goes to your ionized atom. We'll call that state J. We'll call that state J plus one. You know what the J means. Right? And an electron is ejected. So basically, photon comes in, photoionizes the electron, gamma, the photon is absorbed, its energy, H nu, is given to first getting the electron out of the potential well, and the remainder going into the kinetic energy of the electron, and now it's free in the electron pool. You also have what's called recombination. This is the opposite of photoionization. This is where you take something in state J plus a free electron comes by and it combines with the uh, atom. So it goes into state J minus one, which is a lower ionization stage and releases a photon. So, um, photoionization and recombination are the opposite of each other. And they will be in some kind of balance pact with each other. Okay? Uh, when you are in thermo equilibrium, all of these processes are balanced with each other. This, these two are balanced with each other. This is a complement of each other. They are in, uh, the rate of which photoionizations happen will be equal to the rate at which recombinations happen. And that will end up with some equilibrium balance between A sub J and A sub J plus one, or J minus one and J minus two, stuff like that. Same thing with the photo excitations and, and photo de excitations and collisional excitations. Those will be set into some equilibrium. The rates will be the same. It will set up some equilibrium between the uh, a steady state for the ratios of the excited states. And then you have collisional ionization. Okay. And that is basically this kind of thing where you have particle in state J Okay, ionization state J. You probably have a collisional electron here, okay, come by. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna ionize that then to state J plus one, plus the electron that's been freed, plus the collisional electron still, still flying by, okay? So basically what you're saying is an electrons come by with enough kinetic energy and kinetic energy to spare to raise this ground state electron or whatever electron out of the potential well and give it kinetic energy. So now you got the original electron with significantly reduced kinetic energy, the new electron that's been ionized, the photoionized electron, or the, sorry, the collisionally ionized electron. Yeah. So you've added an electron to the pool and in a sense, you've actually, let me ask you this, have you added energy to the electron pool or have you decreased the electron to, the energy to the electron pool? I wanna see what you guys can think through on that. Okay, you have an electron, it's bound, okay? So that's what your initial start is. You have an electron pool out here with energy. Here comes a particle, electron, okay? It gives some of its energy to raising this electron out of the potential well and giving it kinetic energy. Now you have this atom here, which is in a new ionization state. And now you have an additional electron with some kinetic energy and the original electron with less kinetic energy than it had. Overall though, if you look at the kinetic energy, the sum kinetic energy of all the electrons, has it reduced a little bit or has it increased? Reduced. Reduced, why? Because energy has to be conserved and some of the energy goes to electron off the well. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. So in order to get the electron out of the well, that's energy that does not stay in the electron pool. That's 
removed from the electron pools. It's removed from the, cl the, the colliding electrons kinetic energy. So the colliding kinetic energy goes into removing it from the, 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 the potential well and some kinetic energy into that. When you add up these two kinetic energies, it's less than the initial kinetic energy of the colliding electron by the amount of the potential well. And then collisional deionization. Now, it's called collisional recombination. Now, this one is a little bit weird. It's a three body thing. Okay. It's a three body thing that is much more rare because it takes three bodies. But another, and this is sort of called, this is sort of a, you have to have two electrons nearby. And the fact that you've got the other one, it can actually induce a, a recombination of the other electron. Okay. Um, it's, it's a pretty rare case, but does that make sense to everybody? Okay, you've got two electrons, but one help actually interacts with the other to induce it to recombine. Um, so basically it's the opposite of this. You just switch the arrow, just like this is the arrow switching on this one. Okay. All right. So these processes are happening and they're happening in equilibrium so that you have some equilibrium balancing. Okay. In this case, let's look at say, uh, species K. Okay. And we're going to look at species K, and we're going to say the number density of um, I plus 1 J K over the number density of I J K. Right. It's going to be some equilibrium value. Now, what have I written down here? I've said these are excitations, okay? You have photo excitation, photo de excitation, you have collisional excitation, you have collisional de excitation. And so you're in a situation at a given temperature that those are going to be in an equilibrium up and an equilibrium down, but it's going to be set because of the energy balance such that you get some steady state relationship between the number density of atoms in state I to those that are in state I plus one. In other words, let's say that's I equals zero, the ground state, this is I equals one, this is I equals two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're saying is that um, the number density of atoms that are in this state, okay, relative um, to the number density of atoms, say, in this state, okay, that's what you're looking at here. Right. So if I is zero, that is wrong. If I is one, then we're talking about the number density of ground state elements in, in ionization state J and of species K. But if, let's say, that would be this one, okay. And let's say then if we had another atom, it's in stage I plus one, here, which would be stage two, we're talking about the number of density of atoms of species K in ionization stage J that are in the excited state one higher than the IJK state. Is J just another part of the state it's in? Is what? What's J? J is the ionization stage. So let's say we're talking about neutral hydrogen, okay? Neutral hydrogen the ground state is N111, right? 
In the first excited state, it's N2, 1, 1. In this case, J equals 1, K equals 1 between both of those. But here, I equals 1 and I equals 2. This is one of John's markers. <laughs> You see, you, see, you, see what, you see what I'm getting at? So the I is changing, but the J and the K, doesn't matter what they are, they're not changing. Okay, so you're not changing the ionization stage, you're not removing electrons, you're just moving, ele uh, uh, removing them, you're just moving them internally. But what we're saying is that there's an equilibrium value. Anybody with me on that? Okay. So if you include all of that, it turns out that a very simple relation exists. Um, if you go back and look at statistical physics, all right, uh, what you're going to see, you're, you're going to find is that each one of these has an excitation energy associated with it, okay? God, these pens just really bite the dust. Just to make life simpler, I'm gonna drop the J's and the K's, okay? Is that all right? Yes, no, I'll leave them. What were the J and K? J is the ionization level, and K is the species number. I didn't review that. Maybe I should really quickly. We have N, I, J, K, where I is the excitation. J equals the ionization. And K equals the species. All right? What is... What are the indices for helium that's singly ionized in the ground state? Helium is K equals 2. It's singly ionized. Ground state's 1, singly ionized is 2. And it's in the ground. Uh, and it's ground state excitation, one, two, two. Okay. What if it was, what if it was neutral helium that had one electron excited one level? Excited once, ground state, uh, neutral helium. That's why it's very powerful because you can decide, you can write the indices in your computer program and, and it's precisely written. There's one set of indices for every element in every ionization stage. Okay. So one, one is neutral? One is neutral. One is ground state, one is neutral. Okay. So this... The excitation energy here is I one J K because this is I equals one's the ground state. What is that equal to? Zero. Thank you. Here's chi of two J K. Here's chi of three J K. You see, there's an excitation energy associated with each of the I's. Now, it turns out that from statistical mechanics, you have to account for not only the energy coming of the state, but you have to account for a multiplicity of the state, okay? Uh, do you remember the multiplicity of the hydrogen atom? For all states at a certain level? I'm getting looks like well, I don't remember that. This is statistical weight, which was 2n squared. 
Remember these diagrams? Right? This was n equals 2, then you had well, n equals 1, then you had l equals minus 1, 0, and plus 1, and then you had the fact that the electron would have a j, and so um, this is the multiplicity of possible states. I, I can't remember, I can't draw this right off the back, so I, I don't want to take the time. All right. That's basically saying that in, in state one, there's two possible states down here, right? Spin up and spin down, okay? And here, at i equals two, you've got could be in the L equals the S orbit, L equals zero, or it could be in the P orbit, which is uh, L equals one, zero, or minus one, and you can have spin up and spin down, okay? So here, there are six possible states. I'm doing this for hydrogen, by the way. For hydrogenic atoms or for hydrogen? Hydrogenic atoms, thank you. Two squared is four times two, that's eight, sorry. This is for hydrogenic, so I am giving you hydrogenic, all right? And this one is nine times squared. Right? Three squared times two. Right. Hydrogenic for multiplicity of states. Does anybody remember what the chi equals in the hydrogenic atom? In a hydrogenic atom for principal quantum number. This is like 13.598 eV, right? And then this is n squared. So basically, in these really, in these formula where it's doing n, we're indexing, we're indexing them as i's, okay? So in this case, where n equals one, one minus one, chi of one jk equals zero. Uh, where i equals two, one fourth, one minus one is three fourths, so 2jk, it looks like it's equal to 3 fourths. Somebody fix my math if I did it wrong. Uh, 1 ninth, that's 8 ninths. You see what I'm getting at? So in other words, there's a certain amount of energy required to get it up, and there's a certain probability increase because of the multiplicity of states. In other words, there are eight possible states to fill here. So the, with ease, the electron, uh, that makes it easier for the electron to have a propensity to go up. This one has 18 possible states, you know, um, has 3s, up or down, and then it has 3p with L minus one up or down, L zero up or down, and L equals plus one up or down, okay. And then you've got the D where you've got another 10, okay. So what you find is that the probability uh, here basically goes the probability of getting into n basically goes as g to the n, the exponent of minus chi n over kt. That's just a proportionality. And this comes from Boltzmann's statistics. Okay. So what you finally get when you when you when you when you get this out is that the ratio of the density n J is 
sorry, n i plus 1 j k over n i j k ends up being g of i plus 1 j k over g of i j k times exponent of, so it's going to be the exponent of the minus of i plus 1, so that's going to be plus i, j, I plus 1 j k minus chi of i j k, that quantity divided by k t, and that's what you get. Now, it's very likely you've seen that equation in your undergrad classes. Let me just make sure I got that right. Is that slide? No, this is the Boltzmann equation. Boltzmann. Somebody tell me in words what the Boltzmann equation gives you. Yes, it gives you the ratio or the relative densities uh, between two adjacent excitation states, I and I plus one, right? In this case, we could have said I equals two and I plus one is three. It would give us the ratio of the equilibrium densities between them for that. Can we say it one more time? It gives you the, the relative probabilities or the relative population? Relative densities. Relative, the relative number densities um, for some species J, sorry, some species K in ionization state J, doesn't matter what magnesium 2, neutral hydrogen, okay, whatever. It gives you the, the ratio of the number densities of state I excitation to state I plus one excitation. Notice those are adjacent energy states, uh, excitation states. So pick an ion, carbon three, carbon four, it doesn't matter, and then say, how would I know the ratio of the densities between those in, in the third excitation state and the fourth excitation state? They're adjacent. I would go right here. If I know the relative G's of those excitation states, and I know the excitation energies of those excitation states, bam, you got temperature. I believe I'm off by a minus sign. Did I do this math right? Exponential? Don't I need another one in front here? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's so much better. Just give that to John. <laughs> right? You should just tell him to buy his own lock house. Well, that's a great solution, except that's been talked about for years. <laughs> he just needs to not leave them around. Chalkboard. Usually, that would solve all of John's issues. Yeah, chalkboard. No, he would just slam to the top. He would, but like. Okay, everybody got that. There's a minus sign out here. It's always chalk. So, the ratio for a given ion. It's the ratio of the densities for successive excitation states the higher state above the lower state. Okay? I'm gonna keep this one, it actually works. <laughs> so let me write that up here. N of I plus one JK over N of I JK is equal to G of I plus one JK over G of I JK times the exponent of chi of i plus 1 j k minus, this doesn't look very good, but that's i plus 1, and then 
minus chi i j k c. All that divided by kt. So if you're good with math, you can tell me what happens as t goes up. Well, what do you expect to happen when t goes up? Do you expect to see more of them in higher excitation states or more of them in lower excitation states? The first of the two options. The first of the two options, right. So you should see that this ratio gets larger as t goes up. Now, what if we don't want just the relative excitation states? What if we want something more? What if we want What if we want to know something more meaningful? Do you remember what I NJK is? Anybody? The sum over all NIJKs for all I's. Exacto. Basically, what you're saying is the number density of neutral hydrogens, the number density of triply ionized carbon. Okay, I don't care about the different excitation states. I just wonder what's the density of this type of ion, JK. Well, to get that, you have to add up the density of all the different excitation states. So you just add those up and get NJK. What if what you want is this? In other words, what fraction of my neutral hydrogens are in the ground state? What fraction of my first ionized heliums are in the first excited state. Let me go back to the first one first. What fraction of my neutral hydrogens, J equals one, K equals one, are in the ground state, I equals one, J equals one, K equals one. So if you want to know, for example, I've told you before, hey, where's the Balmer decrement for the largest in A stars? What's the temperature? About 10,000. Okay. What is the Balmer decrement? It's the ionization of first excited state neutral hydrogen. So the Balmer, for the Balmer decrement to be the largest there, you would want a very large number density of first excited state neutral hydrogens. You'd want that to be a large number of the neutral hydrogens. You'd want that number to be close to one if it could be, right? You want most of your hydrogens to be neutral and in the first excited state. So you'd want this number to be large. You'd want most of your neutral hydrogens to be in the first excited state, I equals two, if you want the largest uh, Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, or sorry, H beta, H alpha, H gamma lines, and the largest form of break. So how do you get that? Okay. Uh, well, I'm not going to go through all the math because it's right here showing you how you do this. Okay. But I am going to write down the final result for you. Okay. You basically are applying this sum over here in this equation. Okay. Um, and dividing by the uh, neutral, but you end up getting G I J K over uh, times the exponent of minus chi I J K over K T for the numerator and for the denominator, the sum over all I of G I J K exponent of minus chi ijk over kt. Okay. 
Maybe if it makes you feel better, this could be an I prime, whatever. It's just a dummy index over all excitation states. Basically, you're taking the Boltzmann probability term and you are summing it over all excitation states to get uh, as a proxy of the, de the denominator in this term. And you're doing the same. You're just taking the probability uh, proportionality from the numerator as the proxy for the density here and you get this. Now, what we do is we define this thing as the partition function. So we rewrite this as g i j k, whoops, over u j k of t exponent where u of jk is called the partition function and it's equal to that sum. Now, let's look at that partition function for a second. First of all, what are we measuring? For example, the number of I, equal, I equals two neutral hydrogens versus the total number of neutral hydrogens, for example, okay. Equal to this thing here, where we've taken this summation, called it U, the partition function, okay. It only depends upon the temperature and the multiplicity of states and the ions or excitation energy of the states. So basically, it's specific to each species, JK. Okay, that's why it only has a JK because you're summing over all I. You're summing over all excitation states. The only thing that that is related to the gas properties is the temperature. It's only a function of temperature. The rest of it depends upon the excitation energies for that JK. The excitation energies, okay, and the multiplicity of states for each of those state i's, i states, okay, called the partition function. All right. So, if I give you a hydrogenic atom, it's a very simple calculation. If I say to you, I'm going to give you a gas of say, oh, ten thousand degrees, and I want you to calculate for me the relative number of what I'll call bomber hydrogens to neutral hydrogens. How many are in this? How many? Of the, what fraction are, are in the first excited state out of all the neutrals? Three. Okay. So you would basically say, oh, all I need is my GIJKs and my chi IJKs. And I can just perform this math on a computer. Okay, boom. First, what I do is I probably sum over all i to some big number, infinity, and I would get my partition function. Then I would divide that into this, and then I would just take the e to this. There's where the t appears. Boom. I've got the answer. Straightforward. Yes, it's straightforward because the g for a given i and the chi for a given i can be written in simple formulae. So you can calculate this very simply. Only use these formulae plugged into here for hydrogenic atoms. Only. When you have multi-electron atoms, not. Nah. The way that the chi's behave and the g's behave is a completely different beast that we haven't really gotten into. You have to look them up. You have to look up the partition functions. And what we're gonna find uh, later, I'm gonna give you a table uh, from the back of a book called Gray 
Um, it's called the analysis of stellar spectroscopy or something like that. And he has a table of all the partition functions for all the different species, J, K, as a function of temperature. Right? And so armed with that, you can then now say, oh, on the table, I want calcium in the first ionized stage as a function of temperature. Okay, what's my temperature? I read it off the table, boom, I got it. Okay, that's going to happen. But for hydrogen, you can actually calculate it. Or a hydrogenic atom, you can actually calculate it. Okay. Any questions about that? Some notes down somewhere that I'm not remembering, or did I put them back in my binder? Okay. Okay. Now, I want to share with you something. Uh, a lot of stellar astrophysicists don't like to use this notation. They used to like use a notation called theta. Okay? And instead of using exponentials, they used to like to use powers of 10. Why do people want to use powers of 10 instead of exponentials? Because you can rewrite the equations in log form. And instead of multiplying things, you just add them. Okay? So it's a way of it's a way of being able to rewrite things in log, which I'm not going to go through, but I'm going to show you the translation. They basically write the exponent of minus chi ijk over kt as 10 to the theta chi ijk. Okay? where theta is defined as 50-40 over the temperature. So basically, this is your kT, it's, well, it's 1 over kT, and this is your chi i, and then there's some other constants for the base change from e to base 10, and so you basically, uh, sorry, that's a minus. So basically, you can now, um, calculate theta as a function of t and use that and then later on if you want to use it you can use it that way now why do I say that because if you go look at a lot of books on stellar atmospheres and atmospheric physics they tend to like to write things in terms of theta okay and in addition to that when you get the partition function tables they're actually going to be not as a function of temperature they're going to be as a function of theta and the relationship is you can just solve for t if you, to, to know how, what, what t that corresponds to, right? So you're going to get a table of these as a function of theta, but the relationship between theta, theta and t is right there. So you can get it as a function of theta, you're getting it as a function of t. I just want to introduce this to you because you're going to see this uh, on the tables. You're going to see theta. I want you to know where theta came from, what it was, okay? It's one of the beauties of astronomy and physics, and I'm being facetious here, is notation. Different subfields like to do different notations. Okay, so if you want to do straight physics and you're a theorist, you're going to be talking about exponentials. It just makes sense to you. Okay, if you are pushing around numbers on the back of an envelope and you want to add logs because you can do those very simply and you are a stellar spectroscopist observer, you're probably going to use this notation. And when you carry it through, it turns out that then you can like replace that here, you can replace this here, and then this just becomes, you want to take the log of that and the log of this, and then you, this is just the sum of these things and it just becomes much easier. Anybody? Okay. 
So now what have we learned to calculate? What's the only variable we need to know? Temperature. temperature. Have I told you anything about abundances? Have I told you anything about pressures? Have I told you anything about ionization fractions? No. The only physics that matters is the temperature because we've made an assumption, thermal equilibrium. In thermal equilibrium, the rate of anything going up is equal to the rate going down, no matter which rate you pull out of the hat. Collisional excitation, collisional de-excitation, photo excitation, doesn't matter. When, the, when you're in that equilibrium, then the Boltzmann statistics apply and you get this. You know, one of the best ways to develop intuition, if you look at an equation, is what variables are in it? If you're like, I'm, what am I talking about here? First of all, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about what's the number density of some excitation state of an ion relative to the number density of the ion, okay? What does it depend upon in the gas? Ah, temperature. It only depends upon temperature. So I only have one macro quantity of the gas that matters as to what that ratio is going to be. Look at the equation, folks, and look at the variables that are in there. If you see an electron density, it depends on electron density and temperature. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So this only depends upon the structure of the ion itself, and it depends upon the temperature of the gas. Okay. All right. What else do we want to learn? I'll tell you what the holy grail is that we're after. Well, first of all, we do want to know the excitation of this because eventually, let's say, we want to look at the H alpha line and we want to know the profile for the H alpha line. Well, that profile is going to depend upon what? Column density and that cross section. Okay. Column density depends upon what? The integral over the cloud path of the number density along the line of sight. Okay, what number density is that? That, if it's H alpha, is the number density of N211. Balmer state neutral hydrogens. Okay. So, if I want to model that and understand the abundances and everything in my gas, I want to know of my neutrals what what's how many of them are in this stage. Notice that notice that this equation doesn't give me n two one one, which is what I'm after. It gives me the ratio of n two one one to n one one. I still have to figure out how to unfold it to solve for this later, don't I? Which means some, at some point I have to calculate this because if I know this ratio and I calculate N11, I can get to N211 from this Boltzmann equation and stick it in here in my model and get an estimate from my data, a constraint on what N211 has to be. From my, you see what I'm getting at? So I'm going to need to know how many are in neutral state. Okay. How am I going to get that? How am I going to find out well, how, what fraction of my hydrogens are actually neutral and what fraction are ionized?
So. Thought I had a good one. Didn't I have a good one here? Here, buy your own. Oh, thank you. Let's say I want M211. Oops. But I have N211 divided by N11. Neutral hydrogens. Well, we all know that I can solve this. If I know this ratio, I can solve this if I know that. Okay. But how can I get N11? Well, perhaps there's a way to find out. Um, well, this for if I know N1, the no total number density of hydrogens, and I know the ionization fraction of neutral hydrogen, I can get N11. And Let's look at that for a second. To get N11, the number of neutral, the number density of neutral hydrogens, I would have to know the number density of hydrogens altogether Which the number density of all hydrogen together is the sum of all the ionization levels, which is neutral and singly ionized. So I would have to know N11, N1, you're going to be like, wait, this is the chicken before the egg. But if I can figure out N1 and I can figure out the ionization fractions, what fraction of the, of the hydrogens are in the neutral stage, I can get the number density of the neutrals. I get the number density of the neutrals. I can I know this ratio from Boltzmann. I can solve for the number density of hydrogen in the first excited state. And now I've got something that I can put into my model from that matches my data. So what do I need? I need to make sure I know that, and I need to make sure I can calculate these ionization fractions. Does that all make sense to everybody? I'm giving you the why we're doing what we're doing here first. Now, that's a little bit tricky, okay? But it turns out, if you factor out, let me sure I get this right. No, I'm not going to do this right now. Erase all that. I meant to say it the other way around. N1 over N11 is equal to 1 plus N21. So this here, I'm going to invert this. Great. Let's think about this for a second. Okay. I want F11. It turns out that that's defined as N11 over N1. N11 over N1. But I just show that you can write that as 1 over 1 plus N2 over N11. But I need to know N11 to get F11. Okay. 
what I'm going to show you is you can calculate this using Saha. Okay. So if you can calculate successive ionization stages, this is hydrogen for the neutral, the, the, the ionized to the neutral number densities. If you can calculate that, you can plug it into this formula, you can get F11, which you need. You see how it's kind of very convoluted, but. Is that, does that how it works the same way or not? It, you can only calculate adjacent ionization states. Excellent question. The answer is yes. Okay. So, as with the Boltzmann, you can only get ex, uh, adjacent excitation stages. Okay. And then we said, well, if you sum the new denominator, you can get the excitation stage relative to all of those ions. For Saha, we want to eventually be able to get every number density out of our model so that we can plug them into our optical depth and match it to our spectrum. So we ultimately want to be able to get every Nijk because if we have a calcium-2 absorption line from the ground state, we need to know, guess what? We need to know the number density of calcium-2 in the ground state. So what I'm going to show you is the Saha equation provides, and we're going to talk about this much more on Thursday, so I just introduced it to you today. We're going to, if we can do, if we can measure this ratio straight from statistical equilibrium, because remember, detailed balancing, rate up, equal rate down, equilibrium value of the ratios, boom, okay? Then you can plug it through here, you can get F11. N1's easy. Okay. If you know the pressure and temperature of the gas, you can get the total number density of the nuclei. And if you know the total nuclei you, and know the abundance fraction, you get the number density of hydrogen. Then if you can use Saha to measure the ratio of hydrogen ionized to hydrogen neutral, plug it into this equation, you can get the ionization fraction now, N11 over N1. You got N1 here, you got F11 there, you can get N11. From Boltzmann, you get this. From N11 here, you solve for N211. You can plug it in your model. <laughs> it seems like a hell of a lot. But it's really interesting because the way the equations end up working is once you solve for the equilibrium condition of the gas, you just you just apply the equations and you can get everything out. That's what this first homework problem is doing. It's getting you familiar with how to pull out every Nijk. Okay. So I'm giving you a gas pressure, I'm giving you a temperature, and I'm going to say to you, Oh, I give you, what do I give you? The, the things that are required for a gas. You know the temperature, the density, and you need to know the mass fractions of the species. It's only a hydrogen and a helium gas, so I give you a very simple case. Once you know the, the abundance fractions or mass fractions, and the, then you can, you can solve for the equilibrium conditions. Now to make life easy for you, I'm, for, I'm not forcing you to do the ionization equilibrium conditions. I'm gonna give you the ionization fractions. Okay, so I have given you the information you need to get in hydrogen, and I've given, I'm going to give you um, the information to calculate, the, or I've given you the information to calculate electron density, so you can get the nuclei density. The mass fractions will allow you to get the abundance fractions, which from which you get the number density of hydrogen. Okay, now I've given you the ionization fractions already, so you can calculate this. So you've got everything you need for this problem. Okay. All right. So what I've done is given you an overview of why you want to be able to do this. 
I'm not sure it was very effective, but I hope it was. And in the end, it has to do with trying to match your data to some model of the physics. What do we try to measure in astronomy? We try to measure metallicities, we try to measure densities, we try to measure temperatures, we try to measure the physics. How do we do that? We observe light. Light has an absorption line. That absorption line gets identified as coming from, say, H alpha. That means it came from no, the, the, the first excited state, neutral hydrogen, in the gas of that thing. Okay, so I know what optical depth is as a function of wavelength because I've got my absorption line. Okay, I know how it behaves. I know that it, this is column density is an integral of the number density of the, in this case, neutral hydrogens in the first excited states. But I want to look, I also have some metal lines and I want to get the ionization balance so that I can get the metallicity out. How do I do that? Well, I have multiple lines. I might have iron two, multiple lines from iron two. I might have calcium two, I might have sodium one. I might have you know, all these different lines. I, so I need to know, make a model that can calculate me for me all of the NIJKs so that I can then pluck out the ones for which I have absorption lines and try and see if once I make that temperature and density and pressure for that um, gas cloud, do I get out a spectrum from my simple model here that looks or matches my data? Oh, looks like I'm underproducing the iron lines. Well, I'll crank up the abundance fraction of, of my iron and rerun my model because it's going to adjust the electron density. It's going to change some things, some balances. So that some of these sahas and bolts ones will come out a little different. And I'll rerun it, and then I'll put it back in here and go, oh, okay, I got my iron now, but now I'm overproducing sodium a little bit, a sodium one line. Okay, you know, maybe I'll just turn the temperature down a little bit now that I, you know. And you iterate back and forth until you match all your different absorption lines, and you're in the business. Has anybody heard of the program called Moog? Okay. Well, go ask Stin about Moog. I'll tell you all about it. It's a program that somebody wrote, a guy named... Uh, Chris Sneedon at Texas and spent his life building this program that give it a stellar spectrum, give it um, a log G, give it a temperature, give it uh, you know the mass of the star and maybe the age of the star, some other constraints that are more refined and give it the spectrum and off it goes, solves for all the abundance fractions, solves for the temperature and, and iterates until it comes up with a self-consistent atmosphere that matches the data to the best it can. Spits it out and you go, the iron to H ratio is minus 3.2. Stuff like that. This, this is how you do astrophysics. Okay. I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna tell you all about Herr Saha and his equation so that we can learn how to calculate these. And then after I've taught you about Saha, I'm gonna teach you about what I like to call recursive Saha, so that you can get out all the ionization fractions. If you know all the relative adjacent ionization stages, densities, those ratios, it turns out you can apply Saha recursively and you can get out ionization fractions. And the third problem in the homework is to do that. Okay. Okay. All right, folks, don't look too excited.